Uh, thank you all for uh, coming. Welcome to uh, our second conversation. You know, the reason why um, we do conversations at Kickerland is because we are sort of looking for ourselves. We, um, as a company, people, when they see Kickerland, they always think, like, oh, that's fun products. But um, we actually work with very prominent, uh, very good industrial designers, and uh, so we want to promote them and uh, give a little more insight about that. You know, it's very good for Kickland to uh, not only produce fun products, what everybody thinks of Kickland, but we want to give, you know, we really want to promote design. And uh, this is why I am very happy to introduce Josh tonight at the second conversation. Josh, for you. Thanks, Jan. Um, and thanks everybody for coming tonight. It's, uh, really wonderful to see such a, a great cross-section of my life. <laughs> um, they're they're uh, former students and uh, colleagues, educators, uh, friends from way back when. Uh, some of my, my undergraduate friends from Cornell are here that I haven't seen since then. Just fantastic. So, uh, my career has been sort of uh, forged as a designer educator, and I think the uh, business of teaching and practicing has kind of empowered uh, a spirit of experimentation, which is at the core of my, my work. Um, about objects and decoding, uh, we're surrounded by them, and I'm passionate about them. Um, but as a, as a chair of the industrial design program at RIT, as, a, as an educator, uh, I'm, I'm curious beyond the object. I'm curious into systems, and I'm curious uh, into the way that we organize um, our, our behaviors in the world. And so that curiosity um, kind of leads to not just decoding the systems around us, but also encoding. And that's the work of, uh, of designers, the storytelling that is embedded in projects and systems. And this book uh, was kind of at the, at the urging of many uh, past students put together uh, as, a, as a kind of set of lessons or ways of seeing that I've been pushing out to students over many, many years. And uh, the, the metaphor of the lenses um, kind of came into focus, if you will, um, in, in the last year or so before the book was published, in part because I, I looked around me and I saw all the, all the lens references in my life, from the, from the giant lens at Corning that I've been working under, um, to the, the Bausch & Lomb history of, of manufacturing lenses in Rochester, and it, it served uh, as a perfect metaphor for sort of creating a, a taxonomy of lessons uh, in the work that I had done in industry. So I break down the projects into a, a variety of um, focuses or foci, and the so the sharp focus, uh, sort of something we, we often mm -hmm. think about in, in design problem solving, is around creating efficiencies, mm -hmm. and I think that that kind of activity, while while as I said, commonly associated with design, is not the only way to design. However, it did broker a, a wonderful project for Kickerland, thinking about how I could uh, embed a single object in the smallest possible package with as many uh, varied functions as I could for one very specific um, core uh, purpose, and that was the jigger. And uh, Jan and I, I remember, had a series of terrific conversations, kind of refining this. And maybe this is fodder for our conversation later, but a designer does not operate in isolation. Anybody who thinks a designer shows up with a cocktail and happens sketch and it's done is flat out wrong. In, in its best case scenario, a good design uh, is, is all about context and all about the relationship um, with the manufacturer and, and their, and understanding their needs and their systems. So um, together with Jan and his team, uh, we arrived at this uh, wonderful product, which has been in production for quite some time, I think, now. Um, it's won a lot of awards, and uh, best of all, a lot of bartenders like it. <laughs> um, another great Kickerland project that falls under this umbrella was a fairly recent one, these wooden spoons. Um, which in many ways um, really just kind of refine the work of this archetype and look for um, synergies between different 
uh, utilities that, that uh, a wooden spoon performs. They're quite beautiful, but I, I think they're beautiful because of all uh, the smart functions um, that we hope are packed into them. Soft focus, and again, I'm going quickly through all these projects. Each one is its own lecture, but that's why I wrote a book. <laughs> um, the power of suggestion, um, this idea of a kind of um, more uh, uh, emotional design or connection to products. Uh, this was another Kickerlin project, the knockoff lamp, which uh, began its life as a bowling pin. And my interest in this was really about uh, kind of tapping into the collective unconscious around this icon and understanding um, what people see in an object of this nature. People understand the inherent nature of two states around this product, right? When a, when a bowling pin is standing up, it means something. When it's lying down, it means something else. So adding a light source to it uh, makes it a kind of natural uh, kind of um, product for people to enjoy. And, and there's an emotional connection with an object like that that, uh, that sort of sells itself. Macro focus. So um, thinking or taking the long view, let's say, on products and, and thinking about the midlife, the cycle that uh, products go through. Um, this was a, a series of furniture pieces done for a manufacturer in northern Italy called Cosmonia, and uh, quite a successful line, I would say. Um, and, uh, and all of them are, are predicated on the notion that um, eliminating features which cause duress might extend the life cycle of the product. So these are what we call RTA, or ready to assemble, items that live without uh, significant hardware. They come apart, they ship flat, they go back together easily, they can move with you without the parts and pieces that would otherwise cause uh, significant challenges in the life cycle. Micro focus, um, so zooming in and, and thinking um, kind of intensely around objects that might not otherwise uh, be operated on or, or, or simply be avoided because of some of their connotations. Um, this kind of uh, thinking about history um, was embedded in this uh, menorah project, which was done for AreaWare, another New York based uh, product manufacturer. Uh, a very interesting project, uh, in many ways like uh, doing the work of a typographer, seeking an iconic uh, symbol that communicates an idea effectively was sort of the work of defining this uh, product form. But the other piece of it was, was questioning um, the idea of value and what, what is preciousness and you know, all these objects um, of, uh, of significant, um, let's say, uh, religious value or appeal were, were, were often rendered in, in rarefied materials to connotate uh, value. And so I, I wanted to push that and see if it was possible um, without uh, being offensive to make an object in a different material, perhaps uh, something um, more serviceable like uh, cast iron. In the end, this has been a very successful product. Um, in fact, is in the national uh, Museum of uh, Jewish History in Philly in their permanent design collection. And, uh, and what I, the, one of the key observations with this was that most people take a candelabra and stick it on a plate to catch the wax drippings. So I built the plate into the design, um, uh, which was sort of novel. Blurred focus, um, so the idea that, well, maybe we sometimes do the opposite of what we think um, we ought to do to make a, a clarified product. Um, and thinking about the idea of alchemy, right? So this is where I, I stepped in with uh, Glass Lab, and you'll see a little bit more about that on the academic side in a minute. Glass Lab is this absolutely astounding and remarkable program that the Corning Museum of Glass puts together, bringing it, uh, architects and designers uh, into a context where they work with hot glass. And this is uh, just a, a remarkable thing. Um, in any case, I did a project with Glass Lab, and what was wonderful about it is it's, it's kind of rapid prototyping that you do uh, live with someone else, and you have the ability to make changes. The glass is plastic and, and manipulable, uh, unlike the, a lot of the rapid prototyping that we deal with um, in, in other uh, modes today. So these were a bunch of ideas which were like, uh, like line drawings in space for me. Products, but not yet worthy of really being real products, more experimental. This, for example, took advantage of um, the, the new uh, eco-sensitive 
toilet paper rolls that don't have a central tube. I realized, you know, once they don't have a central tube, they don't operate very well on the usual uh, pull-type systems and hardware. But you can pull out from the center, which is a new way of thinking about the rolls. So maybe we should make a product about that. You know? <laughs> uh, and another uh, fantastic collaboration that I recently entered into with a group called Other, which is here in Manhattan doing amazing work in 3D printing. Uh, and that also feels to me like, like alchemy and sort of uh, pushing the, the limits of what's possible technologically. Um, and finally, in the book, there's, there's a pushing these lessons to another uh, level, something I call the deconstructed lens, which takes apart um, what we know uh, to, um, to, to give as many lessons as possible about going through the process. I'm thinking about something I call cultural resonance. What's sticky with culture? And this project um, was a stool designed for Casamania, uh, the same company I made the, uh, the RTA furniture for. Uh, the, you obviously can't read this, but uh, it's a timeline in the book that, that decodes the process of the designer and the manufacturer and kind of timelines it out and tries to clarify what those two roles are, how they intersect, uh, in, in order to really teach students of design and, and young people who would knock at the door, uh, companies like Kickerl and, and sort of make assumptions about what that relationship might be like. And, and this makes clear, I hope, how important the, the symbiotic relationship is between designer and manufacturer, while at the same time uh, sort of showing my process and the testing and the uh, presentations uh, and the development of, of, of one particular product. Actually, there's three and the deconstructed lens in the book. So, you know, it's, design is a lifestyle for me. It's, it's inseparable from the way I see the world, the way that I experience things, the way that I um, strive to, to make things better, people better. Uh, and and I, I put this slide up because um, uh, often people, especially former students, interns, collaborators, they, they say, I remember that slide. Um, and it, if you can't read it, it says uh, family at the top, um, and, uh, and my family's here tonight, the front row, and hiding back there somewhere. <laughs> um, but the, the and, and that shows kind of where my priorities are, but the, perhaps the interesting thing, um, besides the, the, the family piece, is that academics and practice live on the same uh, level, right? They, 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 there's a symbiosis there that, uh, that I think makes everybody better. Um, and, and as I said, life is complicated. Finding simple is an aspiration. Uh, but part of the way I'm able to do all these things, I think, is by creating some efficiencies. And so the house and the studio are, have always been linked in my professional life. Uh, and that, that way I can be in two places instead of three. And that's a big, big difference. So thank you very much. The hashtag thingy there that my students tell me I must put on <laughs> at, at Josh Owen Design. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Woo!